A very good morning to everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to participate in this conference. It is indeed my honor and privilege. In the next 20 minutes, we will take a look at enhanced recovery after cesarean delivery. The outline of my lecture will be what is ERAS and what is its purpose, the elements of ERAS for cesarean delivery, what is the evidence for improved outcomes, what are the hurdles to implementation of ERAS and we will conclude with some take home points. So if you look at enhanced recovery after surgery, basically it in, it's an evidence based patient centered care that involves multimodal interventions to be implemented to modify the inflammatory and metabolic changes associated with surgery so that there is a better patient recovery, improved patient outcomes and financial benefits. Another very important advantage or importance of ERAS is that it standardizes the perioperative patient management and decreases the variability in the perioperative care. If you look at enhanced recovery in obstetrics, how is this different from ERAS for other surgeries like colorectal surgeries or gynecological surgeries? Basically in obstetrics, we are dealing with younger patients who do not have several comorbidities. And the second thing is that we are looking at outcomes in two different people, the mother as well as the neonate. So that's how enhanced recovery in obstetrics is slightly different. Although uh, enhanced recovery in obstetrics was introduced as early in 2013, this editorial is from International Journal of Obstetric Anesthesia in 2013, it was only recently between 2018 and 20 that the ERAS Society in Sweden came up with guidelines for pre, intra and post operative care as three sets of guidelines to be implemented as protocols for caesarean delivery. And the Society of Obstetric Anesthesia and Perinatology has come up with a consensus statement and recommendations for enhanced recovery after cesarean section. This has been published in May 2021 and it composed of 25 elements of care which are from the pre to intra to the post-operative phase. The pre-operative elements include limiting the fasting interval and carbohydrate loading, patient education, lactation preparation and hemoglobin optimization. The intraoperative elements include preventing spinal anesthesia induced hypotension, maintaining normothermia, optimizing uterotonic administration, antibiotic prophylaxis, intraoperative and postoperative nausea vomiting prophylaxis, multimodal analgesia, promoting breastfeeding, IV fluid optimization and delayed cord clamping. The postoperative elements include early oral intake and mobilization, promoting maternal rest periods, early urinary catheter removal, venous thromboembolism prophylaxis, facilitating early discharge, anemia remediation, breastfeeding support, again multimodal analgesia, glycemic control and return of bowel function. So let's quickly go through each of these elements. So starting with the preoperative elements of enhanced recovery after cesarean, limiting the fasting interval. Traditionally, it was believed that parturians had to fast from midnight to reduce the risk of aspiration. But with the availability of gastric ultrasound, we do know that clear fluids are rapidly emptied from the stomach and as such gastric emptying is normal during pregnancy, it's slowed only with the onset of labor. The advantage of limited fasting that it, it limits the metabolic stress and ketosis, there is no added risk of aspiration. So solids are recommended for six to eight hours before, clear oral liquids are recommended two hours before the scheduled cesarean delivery. Non-particulate liquid carbohydrate loading is also recommended. It has to be non-particulate because of the increased risk of aspiration and parturience. 45 grams of carbohydrate is what is recommended and this can be provided with 500 ml of clear apple juice given 2 hours before the scheduled caesarean delivery. This carbohydrate in the clear fluid is important because it has been known to reduce the maternal hypoglycemia and metabolic stress. But this carbohydrate loading is avoided in diabetic mothers. Patient education, this is again a very important part of ERAS because it is a shared decision made, making. So the patient education and counseling helps the patient to participate better in the whole process of enhanced recovery. So educational material can be provided in the form of brochures, internet based uh, information, etc. So as I said, active participation of a patient requires patient education. So the patient, if the patient participates, there's a better impact on outcomes. We need to give information on how the operative delivery will be, how the anesthesia will be conducted, what to expect intraoperatively, what to expect postoperatively, what will be the length of stay, what will be the criteria for discharge, all this goes on into the patient education. Specifically, the patient also has to be educated about lactation and breastfeeding through handouts, books and classes. This is very important because early breastfeeding promotes the maternal neonatal bonding. It reduces the infectious complications in the infant. Uh, and in general, there is an improved neonatal and maternal outcomes. Another fifth component of the preoperative element of uh, enhanced recovery after cesarean is 
hemoglobin optimization. This is because the prevalence of iron deficiency anemia is quite rampant in India when compared to the West. It's almost 63%. So we need to screen for anemia, supplement with iron. This is because preoperative anemia, it has to be corrected because it is a significant predictor of postoperative anemia, which in turn results in morbidities like postpartum depression and fatigue. So this has to be handled preoperatively itself. Moving on from pre-op to the intraoperative elements of Iraq. The most important thing is preventing spinal anesthesia induced hypotension. So we do know that spinal anesthesia is the commonest form of anesthesia given for cesarean deliveries. So we have to maintain the baseline blood pressure. We know spinal anesthesia, there is a sympathectomy which is going to result in hypotension. It's basically an afterload driven problem. So it has to be managed with vasopressors along with a co-load of crystalloid of up to one liter immediately and rapidly after the spinal injection. Regarding the choice of vasopressor, what is recommended in Iraq protocols is prophylactic vasopressor infusion, phenylephrine at 0.5 to 1 microgram per kg per minute or norepinephrine at 0 0.05 to 0 0.075 microgram per kg per minute as an alternative. So phenylephrine as well as norepinephrine infusions, one of the two can be used for preventing spinal induced hypotension for cesarean deliveries. Another important thing is to maintain normothermia. This is because perioperative hypothermia is very common in cesarean delivery under spinal anesthesia. It's close to 50 to 80 percent. And what happens is the drop in core temperature, mean core temperature is around 1.3 degrees centigrade, usually happening one hour after spinal anesthesia and keeps falling even after the completion. And recovery takes close to four and a half hours. So it is very important to prevent hypothermia because it is associated with adverse maternal as well as fetal outcomes. So how do we maintain normothermia? We have to keep the OR temperature around 23 degrees centigrade. Monitor the temperature. Generally, core temperature monitoring will be difficult unless we're giving general anesthesia. So mostly axillary temperatures are monitored. So we have to remember to add 1 to 2 degrees centigrade to calculate the core temperature from this. And active warming has to be pursued. Cover the patient with blankets. Warm all the intravenous fluids with through fluid warmers. Use convective warmers, forced air warmers like the bear huggers. So keep the patient warm. It's very, very important to prevent hypothermia. Optimize uterotonic administration. So to prevent uterine atony and postpartum hemorrhage, we routinely administer uterotonics. But what is important to remember is that we have to use the lowest effective dose necessary to achieve adequate uterine tone to avoid the side effects which are seen with these uterotonic agents. So general recommended doses, the dose is much lesser for an elective cesarean section compared to an intrapartum cesarean section where the patient is already on oxytocin infusion for labor. So the IV bolus for elective sex cesarean is one unit followed by an infusion of 2.5 to 7.5 units per, per hour. For intrapartum, the IV bolus is three international units given over 30 seconds, followed by a bolus of 7.5 to 15 international units per hour. An important thing to remember is this is an Iraq protocol. If there is going to be uterine A tony and postpartum hemorrhage, massive hemorrhage, quickly we need to shift from the Iraq protocol to the resuscitation protocols of our own institutes and uh, practices. Antibiotic prophylaxis. Operative delivery is going to increase risk of infection 5 to 24. So, going to be prolonged hospital stay, increased risk of readmission. So, a single dose of broad spectrum antibiotic like this from the cephalosporin group, uh, cephalosporin group 1 gram is what is generally administered. And this has to be administered before skin incision, not after cord clamping. So, this is a criteria for Iraq protocol. It's also a criteria for Joint Commission accreditation as well as the NABH accreditations. All of them recommend. Prophylactic antibiotics should be given within 60 minutes of skin incision. Moving on to nausea and vomiting prophylaxis, we need to pre uh, prevent it both intraoperatively and postoperatively. Intraoperatively, one common reason is hypotension for vomiting. So prophylactic vasopressor infusion prevents hypotension and so prevents intraoperative vomiting. Similarly, uterine exteriorization by the surgeon is another reason why vomiting happens and this also has to be avoided. For preventing postoperative nausea vomiting, we need to use two antiemetics with two different mechanisms of action. So the two commonly used drugs are ondansetron 4 mg and dexamethasone 4 mg, especially when we're using neuraxial opioids, which increases the risk of nausea and vomiting. Another important thing to remember is dexamethasone has a slower onset of action. So if we give it intraoperatively, it is only going to prevent postoperative nausea and vomiting. Preoperatively, the metoclopramide, which we give as a prokinetic to prevent aspiration, actually helps in reducing the risk of intraoperative nausea and vomiting. Moving on to analgesia, it has to be multimodal with a combination of opioid analgesics, non-opioid analgesics, parenterally and regional blocks. So regarding opioid analgesia, we know spinal anesthesia is the common technique used. So when we're giving the spinal itself, we can club it with intrathecal opioids. So 8 to 10 milligrams of 0.5% bupivacaine is usually combined with 10 to 15 micrograms of fentanyl. 
This decreases the dose of local anesthetic, decreases the extent of hypotension and potentiates the analgesia. It's also combined with uh, longer acting drugs like intrathecal morphine. If we do this, we can prolong the analgesia for 24 hours into the post-operative period. If you use intrathecal morphine, 50 to 150 micrograms or epidural morphine, 1 to 3 milligrams can also be used. So it's important to remember that if you use short-acting drugs like fentanyl with abupivacaine, it only provides intraoperative analgesia. But if we add morphine, it increases the duration of analgesia into the post-operative period. One important thing about neuraxial opioids is we need to choose the optimal dose to balance analgesia at the same time, avoiding adverse effects like nausea and vomiting, pruritus, urinary retention and respiratory depression. Regarding the non-opioid analgesics, which I use, the two commonly used drugs are paracetamol and uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like diclofenac and ketorolac. These have to be started in the intraoperative period itself. We should not be waiting for the spinal to regress and the patient start having pain in the post-operative period. So paracetamol 1 gram intravenously and ketorolac 15 to 30 milligrams intravenously after the peritoneum is closed. So these are administered intraoperatively itself. What about regional anesthesia, the ro role of blocks like tap blocks and the QL blocks? So these are good adjuvants, especially when intrathecal morphine cannot be administered. For example, we do the procedure under general anesthesia, then they become very good adjuvants to uh, postoperative analgesia. Promoting breastfeeding and maternal infant bonding. This is very, very important because this skin to skin contact between the mother and the baby, it supports the golden hour concept of breastfeeding initiation within one hour of birth. But then it requires nursing support because the patient is going to be lying on the table on that side of the screen the surgery is continuing this side we will have to create space for the nurse to hold the baby and allow breastfeeding by the mother during the surgery itself so we need to move the ecg electrodes and equipment to make space for this intravenous fluid optimization again maintaining u volemia is a core principle of eras so we need to limit intravenous fluids intraoperatively during cesarean delivery to less than three liters in routine cases as long as we don't have too much of intraoperative blood loss. And the fluid therapy is actually based on physiological endpoints. Delayed cord clamping. This is again recommended by the ACOG. Cord clamping is delayed by 30 to 60 seconds in vigorous term and preterm infants. Because there's a physiological placental transfusion which is going to increase the blood volume in the newborn by at least 10 ml per kg. It increases the hemoglobin. So it reduces the need for volume resuscitation of the neonate. And it also actually has been shown to decrease the incidence of intraventricular hemorrhage and necrotizing enterocolitis in the neonate. So delayed cord clamping is recommended. It's only deferred under certain conditions like maternal instability or if there is a neonatal need for immediate resuscitation. Thromboprophylaxis, though it is actually mentioned as a post-operative element, the mechanical thromboprophylaxis has to be started intraoperatively itself by using pneumatic compression devices. And this has to be continued post-operatively till the patient becomes ambulatory. And if there is a high-risk parturient, then we also have to add pharmacological uh, thromboprophylaxis. So this is because uh, venous thromboembolism is very common because of the hypercoagulation nature of pregnancy. What about the post-operative elements of Iraq? Most important thing is early oral intake. Traditionally, what was recommended was a delayed oral intake where we used to wait for bubble sounds or passage of flatus and stools and then start the oral intake. But according to Iraq, early oral intake within 60 minutes of admission to the PACU, post anesthesia care unit or the recovery room with just water is very, very important. This helps with bowel function. And the IV has to be stopped once the oxytocin infusion is complete. And within four hours, if the patient has no other comorbidities, regular diet can be started. So the advantages of early oral intake is that it's going to promote return of bubble function, reduce post-operative catabolism, improve insulin sensitivity, and reduces the surgical risk response, stress response. There is no increased incidence of complications. There's no increased incidence of post-operative nausea and vomiting. Early mobilization. This is another very, very important post-operative element. The patients should be made to ambulate as soon as motor function returns. The advantage of early ambulation is the patient is uh, having a better FRC, lesser incidence of hypoxia because they are not uh, lying down on the bed. Venous thromboembolism risk is also much lesser. So what is recommended by the SOAP consensus statement is 0 to 8 hours they should sit on the edge of the bed. Then they should be out of bed to chair and ambulate as tolerated. Although we say early ambulation, there are several barriers to ambulation like the urinary catheter is not removed, then it can be a barrier to ambulation. So generally, the six, within 6 to 12 hours, the urinary catheter has to be removed. There is some controversy. Uh, some of the guidelines say you can remove the urinary catheter immediately after the surgery, but then sometimes that increases the risk of urinary retention. So the SOAP consensus statement recommends urinary catheter removal in 6 to 12 hours. 
Similarly, if there is poor pain control, then the patients won't ambulate. So we need to take care of analgesia to ensure adequate ambulation. Similarly, the sedation, they won't ambulate. If there's nausea, vomiting or dizziness, they can't ambulate. Slow block regression, they can't ambulate. So all these are barriers to ambulation, which we need to address if you want to ensure early ambulation in the postoperative period. Now, the, the mother also needs adequate rest. Otherwise, she's going to go into fatigue and depression. So what is recommended for this is cluster interventions. Let her not be disturbed. Like one person goes and sees the vital signs, comes out after two, three hours, another person goes to give the analogy. Saying, instead of doing like this, cluster interventions are recommended where at one go, we go see her and then do all the necessary procedures and then come out so that she can continue to rest after that. The other post-operative elements are to facilitate early discharge. So this has to be planned from the pre-operative period as to what and all are the criteria which are going to be for discharging the patient home. And usually most of them can be discharged on the second day after cesarean delivery. Anemia remediation. So repeating the hemoglobin count in the post-operative period is not necessary unless the patient had pre-operative anemia or she had a major intraoperative blood loss. Breastfeeding support has to be continued through lactation groups and this has to be continued at home as well. Prompt, uh, promote the return of bowel function. This is again very, very important. And uh, this also has to be, uh, we have to make sure that proper bowel function return is there. Multimodal analgesia. We spoke about multimodal analgesia in the intraoperative period. In the postoperative period, another important thing to remember is analgesics should be given at a scheduled time. Like if it's one gram of paracetamol intravenously every six thali. If the patient has started taking orally, 650 milligrams of paracetamol once in six thali. Similarly, ibuprofen 600 milligrams. So it should be on a scheduled basis and not SOS when the patient has pain. So analgesia is a very important part. And glycemic control, the blood sugar has to be kept less than 180 to 200 milligram per deciliter because otherwise there is an increased risk of infection, which can again further delay discharge and have a worse maternal outcome. Now, who are all the team members of Iraq? It's not a one man job. So we need anesthesiologists, obstetricians, neonatologists, the nursing team, the lactation consultants and wherever community physicians are available and the most important person in this is the patient who has to be motivated to follow all these uh, protocols. Is there any evidence for positive outcomes with Iraq? So this is a very uh, recent study where they looked at 3,679 deliveries, 2,000 plus were before they implemented uh, Iraq protocols and 1,500 plus were after they implemented Iraq protocols and they looked at outcomes like length of stay, financial costs and opioid consumption. So they did find that the length of stay was much lesser in the Iraq group. It was statistically significant. The cost was much lesser. The opioid requirement was much lesser. And as far as readmission, there was not much of a statistically significant difference. So Iraq's is uh, enhanced recovery after cesarean delivery protocols are associated with better maternal outcomes. But then are there any barriers to implement implementation of Iraq? So the most important thing is it's a multidisciplinary team involvement. Everyone has to give their time and energy and coordinate with each other. Sometimes at an organizational level, there can be resistance to change at multiple levels. That's one of the barriers to implementation. The second thing is worry whether it is safe to implement ERAS. I mean, normally we discharge patients on the fourth or fifth day and suddenly we are now discharging patients after elective surgery, cesarean delivery on the second day itself. We do worry because many of these patients are illiterate. They wouldn't know if they're getting into a complication in their house. If they do develop, the community health services are not well developed. They may not be able to reach back to the hospital on time and internet availability and teleconsultation services are all not well developed in the country. So these are some of the reasons why ERAS has not been implemented as avidly as it should have been. So to conclude my lecture, there are several advantages to implementing enhanced recovery protocols in cesarean delivery. It's a better obstetric experience and quality of care, improved satisfaction, earlier discharge, so reduced risk of infection and morbidity in the mother, and efficient use of healthcare resources. But it needs multidisciplinary coordination because it involves multiple steps. But we will have to embrace if you want to progress towards it. Although it is meant for elective cesarean delivery, many aspects of this anesthesia care can also be applied to emergency cesarean sections. Thank you very much for your patient listening.